This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The opinions expressed in this episode are not to be construed as medical advice. Welcome to Demystify Beauty, a weekly podcast about creating a transparency in the beauty space. I'm Mackenzie Westmore. And I'm Dr. Paul Nassif. How are you, Dr. Nassif? Yeah, I've had a busy week as usual. It's great to see you. You know, um, Great to see it's... you. Now, where are you now? You're in Henderson. I'm right? in Vegas. You're in... Uh, yeah. I'm in Henderson. Are you enjoying I'm loving it? Loving it. I love it. I don't like the heat. I, you know me. I'm I'm an LA girl, so the the heat gets to me a little bit. I actually did pass out the other day. Not gonna lie. <laughs> what? I spent a little too much time outside, and I passed out. I had my first pad, my first heat exhaustion. So yay, first heat exhaustion. Um, but other than that, I I freaking love it. I, I love the area. I love the people. I, I just I, I just love everything about it. There's no traffic. Like wow. <laughs> I know it's probably 120 degrees out there right now. So you know. it is. Yeah, a pool is a blessing. So that 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 has become my saving grace, and I never liked pools until now. <laughs> like one air conditioning is a blessing. My goodness. Air conditioning is a godsend. Okay. But remember, so. when you're ready to drive, yes. probably from your house a good 35 minutes away. For that good Mexican food, let me know. Oh yes, you've got to get. You've got to tell me. I want to go try it. I'm gonna try it. Remember, it's I definitely Micho, will. Micho Con. Micho, Micho Con. Wait a second. I've heard of it. I've heard good things about yeah. that. This is way out in um, oh, Centennial. Summerlin, right? Oh, Centennial. Okay. Wait there. Because I go to Red Rock. Yeah, no, I the, love Red Rock. It's it's a little to the right, further down. Red Rock's for <laughs> okay. So what are I'll we? Check it out. So I want to hear about our wonderful guest. So excited for our guest today because this is taking beauty on the inside. So I want to introduce the amazing Dr. Penn, who is a licensed clinical psychologist in Los Angeles, and his clientele consists of adult men and women who are seeking to expand their awareness and overcome their dysfunctional thinking and feelings and acting out on and issues that are explored and worked through in his practice. So with that, Dr. Penn, I will let you take it away and... Tell us, tell us all about beauty on the inside. <laughs> well, it's it's uh, it's good to meet you. It's good to meet you, Doctor Nassif. It's a uh, it's a pleasure. You know, it's funny because when 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 you reached out to me, McKinsey, a while ago, that like a day or two before, maybe a day before you reached out to me, I was talking to my wife and I kind of felt like Nora Ephron, and I said, I don't like my neck. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like what? yeah so i mean she wrote that book I'm, I'm sure you've heard of it before it's like i i, I hate my neck it was just it's such a great title but uh it was just so funny like like i was just like thinking you know because i'm in my 60s and it's like you just like sit there and you go wait a minute who's looking back at me and it's one of those things where i just said to myself god i don't like my neck and and it's it's like oh you found the right person, <laughs> my friend. When you're ready to have some fun, you know, you're local. We can uh, do a little exam and take care of you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll yeah. come into a drive You got the best guy here. Yeah. So anyway, so that's that's what I was thinking at the same time you called me. So it's kind of serendipitous. So May I ask, how do you guys know each other? I've known Dr. Penn for many, many, many years. Um, dear friend, and uh, we go way back, Dr. Penn. And, you know, he's, he's somebody that's always been there for me. Uh, when I need to bounce an idea off of, off of him, he's, he's, he's there. Yeah. Yeah. Mackenzie's just, she's just a force of nature and she's wonderful. And so, you know, you know, those people in your life that you just feel better every time you see them. It's kind of like the same thing. Yeah. Ooh, isn't that a beautiful crawl me? Look at that. Mackenzie. That is so sweet. Making <laughs> me fly. Oh, hey, Dr. Penn. <laughs> so. I know. What. So what is your wheelhouse, if I'm being asked? Uh, what I, what I, my, the, the best person that I could work with is, uh, is what I call high functioning erotics. <clears throat> I like working with very smart people. I like working with people that have a sense of insight uh, and an ability to, you know, to really go deep. So, um, you know, when I worked in, when I started, when you work in training, I'm sure you know this too. When you work in training, you take whoever walks in through the door or, you know, you're in a you're in a clinic and you're getting your hours. 
And when I worked with lower functioning people, I just wasn't good at it. I just got exhausted. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, you know, I was like, I was looking at my watch. Wow. You know, I was, you know, every hour felt like two <laughs> hours. So um, you were bored. I was bored. Uh, I would be thinking about what I was having for lunch. And then for a minute, I was, oh my God. <laughs> and then for a minute, I was thinking it was my fault. And then I, I eventually realized that my patients were literally hypnotizing me. And, and not on purpose, but they were just like, just like there and their, and their psychology was just so like, I'm trying to talk up here and they're just like, and I realized that. So I, I've been fortunate that I have a very curated practice. I, I work only with people that I want to, and obviously they have to want to work with me, but it's a pleasure when you find yeah. someone to come in and it's just like the hour just goes like very quickly. And it's, a, it's it, I learned from it. It's wonderful. So I, I've been very fortunate that way. And I see a lot of couples too. Yeah, I see a ton of couples. We have a bunch of questions, but right off, the, I, I just need to ask a question because this has been a running joke that I've seen in movies, yeah. that when somebody goes to see a psychologist, psychiatrist, they kick their shoes off, and that's a sign that the hour has begun. Is that true? <laughs> I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that. Really? Yeah. No, if someone wants to yeah. some people lie down. You know, I was trained in analysis, so, uh, but... But I don't really do analysis because analysis is kind of, it's a rich man's sport you have, or a rich woman's sport. You have to go four or five times a week and it's exhausting. But people lie down on the couch. You know, when you lie down on the couch in therapy, you, you tend to have more regressed memories. It's very, it's mm, very vulnerable because, you know, you're, you're, like, you're like prone, like you can't, you can't escape. So there's a level of trust. And um, so that's always fun. And what made you interested in becoming a clinical psychologist? Well, I'm the walking wounded. I had, I had, I had really mm. shitty parents and it was either I'm going to deal with one of my favorite sayings is either we deal with our issues or our issues will deal with us. Ah. So after my uh, first wife left me, I was just a wreck and she left me for good reason. You know, I was a narcissist and I didn't know I was a narcissist. And, um, and then when you, when you have what's called in my field, it's called a narcissistic injury where, you know, you realize that, you know, you think you're funny, but really your flies undone the whole time. And that's what they're laughing at. So I went into analysis and, um, it really, really helped me. Uh, I was in two analysis and, uh, different times in my life. And it's just either we deal with our issues or they're going to deal with us. And I decided I'd rather deal with my issues. You went into it analysis as the specialty, correct? Well, I I thought I was going to be a psychoanalyst, but you know, by the time I got, because um, I, I had my own company in my twenties, I was very it was very well known, I was successful, but then I, I pivoted after my my first wife left me, and um, I went into analysis because I think it's. The one, what I've learned in retrospect is it teaches you how to think. It really teaches you how to think about the human condition. So it, it's, you don't have to be an analyst to get your, your doctorate in psychoanalysis. And then when you're like almost 40 and you've got your degree, then, then if you want to be a psychoanalyst, you have to have a control patient for like three years. And then you have to have a psychoanalyst that you pay to give you super supervision. And I just needed to get on with my life. And I, and I think I made the exact right decision to do that. So since so, so you were a narcissist. Yes. And you needed analysis of yourself. Yes. Who did that for you? Were you able to do it yourself? No, I, I was I was with a, a very well known Anna, a, a Vitas Panasian, yeah, very very well known, and um, you know it's one of those things where you're just you're just there and you're and you're and you're very humbled. I was very humbled, and I I think what I think what was good is I was open. I was open to saying like you know whatever whatever I was doing up to this stage of my life just was not working for me. Like whatever was going on for me, and I, I needed someone else's eyes that you could learn to trust to say, 
I remember one of the things he said to me early on in my analysis. He goes, Gary, you're looking for a high penis. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Did you say high penis or happiness? Ha happiness. <laughs> happiness. <laughs> so I thought that was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> True as well, but I thought it was really funny. <laughs> that that is extreme. Yeah, I just I want to know what is it on, from you, Doctor Penn? Why do you think people struggle? Because so many do struggle with self love. What what are some of the what are the, some of the main reasons that you see? All right, I'll give you I'll give you a clue. It's it's one of two people. Okay, um, the first one. Starts with it's three three letters. The first one starts with an M and ends with an M. And the second one starts with a D and ends with a D. Look, okay. mom and dad. Huh? Mom and dad. You, you <gasps> just you know look. We we have wow. when you have sh when you have shitty parents when you have bad parents who don't love you well or just broken. It's kind of like you would consider yourself a Christian or you would consider yourself a Jew or a Muslim or what have you, just because your parents tell you a story. You know, they'll tell you this story. Hmm. This is what happened. And Jesus is going to, he's a place called heaven. And if you accept him, you'll do this. Or the Jews will say, that's crazy walking on water. That doesn't make any sense, but it makes sense that Moses parts the Red Sea. So then I'll be a Jew. And if my parents tell me that I'm unlovable, that I'm not interesting to them, I'm going to feel like I'm unlovable or I'm going to feel that I'm worthless. So you just hear a story because when we're young, uh, parents are gods to us. I mean, they're just like, they're just gods yeah. like from Mount Olympus. And I, when I heard your, uh, your interview with your father, that was a terrific interview that you, that you both did. I don't know if this is to be true, but it sounds like your father's just terrific. He is. He's a lovely yeah. man. You know, he is. And that's, he's amazing. And, yeah, and that's a blessing to have that kind of relationship. And both my parents are. I, I will be honest, both are. And it's interesting you say that about religion because they are under the, the basis of Christianity, but they never forced it upon mm -hmm. me. And I, interestingly enough, then as I got into my twenties, I became a church goer and I became the one that became more religious. Um, even though I, I was not raised in a house like mm -hmm. that, you know, I went to church once at a blue moon, but it was very, very open-minded home, very mm -hmm. loving home. Yeah. I was always told I was special. And, and it's interesting with what you're saying, because the mom and dad factor, that is a big factor. You're absolutely right. I, I can see it sure. now. No, and you so know, it's, that's interesting. What... it's interesting from hearing you say that because um, I was, you know, raised in a typical Lebanese household. Even my parents were born here, but they fell. And, you know, it was, you know, not verbally abusive, but it was normal. That's what how, you know, the treaty and marriages and, you know, families were like. It was interesting when I got married for my first marriage. Mm -hmm. I thought arguing and all that stuff was all norm. And um, it affected again everything, like you said, in my life because of watching my parents. You know, and um, my mom was very expressive in her love. My father was a little bit more stoic, uh, very tough, you know, tough, crotchety kind of old guy. But he was mm -hmm. old when he had me. And the funny thing is, when I realized your parents, like you just said, are the most important part of how you really come out. Um, then when I had my own kids after listening to this, you know, to thinking about that, I had my three boys with the first marriage when I, you know, obviously we had our own difficulties and subsequently divorced. Mm -hmm. And we both weren't happy. And how... Her, I raised my kids then compared to I have a baby now. I'm 61. I have a two and a half year old. Well, she'll be three in October. And I have a wonderful, you know, I'm friends with the ex. And I have a wonderful wife and very nurturing, very loving. And I'm, you know, deeply in love. And with our baby, it's plus again, she's a girl. It's absolutely, um, 
so incredible about when you talk about love, especially to your children. It's oh, yeah. interesting as I learned as I got older and more mature, you know, Mackenzie, because I have my three boys, which are older, I was always very loving. But now in an older age, and I'm a little bit more right, it's actually easier to give out. Mm -hmm. Especially yeah. the baby. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's and such I, a joy. It is. And I, I find it so interesting as the three of us speak, um, we're all on our second marriages. <laughs> um, <laughs> something that just caught my, my ear. Um, and I do find that interesting, you know, from my perspective, you know, I, because I grew up with such a loving household, loving parents, but at the same time, there was something obviously that I was questing for in, in the wrong places. Uh, my, my first go around and, and I, I know my mistakes. I know where I went wrong and I know where I went right. And it's, it's interesting that even though I did have such loving parents, I, I really had a, a tough go the first time around. Mm -hmm. And I, I do find it interesting that the, the, the parental, and, and like you said, Dr. Nassif, you know, with, with my first um, husband, because of the, the Italian um, New Jersey background, it was a, a louder household. And, and I'm not used to that. I'm a very quiet, meek, you know me, I'm, I'm, I'm very simple, quiet little thing. And I just, I shut up. <laughs> um, but, you know, I just find that, that very fascinating and interesting. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that is, it's, 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 it's something that, you know, we've all keep learning. And the, so yeah. by the way, so Dr. Pin, when you go into your office mm -hmm. from what you do, what does that first session look like? You yeah. I'm always very hopeful. Like I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I hear stories that are, some of them are really horrific, you know, people who've been incested and beat and parents dying and alcoholism and bring, you know, just really horrible stuff. Not always. I mean, some, most, some people, whatever, it's like, you know, just middle of the road stuff. But the, I'm very hopeful in my work because if you come to see me, if someone says to Gary, do you like, do you get depressed in your job? And I go, no, because if you come to see me and you're 40 years old, let's say, I've never met you before this very moment. Like I've never met you, Dr. Nassif, until this very, very moment. You've lived 61 years in your life. I have never met you. So I'm not taking responsibility for whatever happened to you, but I know that by you coming to see me, you will feel better your life will level up. Mm -hmm. You'll start to deal with your issues instead of having your issues dealing with you. So I'm very hopeful and um, I'm, I'm, I'm confident, but I'm also like grateful that someone comes to see me and they, and they give me that trust. I mean, obviously you may have, I have a reputation, which is a good reputation, but you, you also have to earn it. You have to, you have to give, people something where they could say, oh, okay, that's important to me. And so that, that is just, it's, it's really fun. It's challenging. I learn a lot. I, I know one thing about being a psychologist, I learned this early on that I can never go anywhere with my patient that I cannot go myself. If I'm uncomfortable, let's say with hating my father and you hate your father, I can't help you through that. Or if I have all this sexual shame and you want to be sexually free, it's going to be hard. It's, I'm not going to be able to really help you. So it kind of forces, it forces me to kind of, if there's any roadblocks, if there's any clogs in the drain that I have to look at that. So it's kind of like almost working out a lot uh, with what I do it kind of helps me in that way. Now I'm, I'm curious because we're talking about self-love and, and people deal with so many different issues. I mean, from anxiety, dysfunctional thoughts, depression, yeah. uh, what are, what are some of your best tips that, that you would give people that are suffering? Well, when, when any, when anyone mentions suffering, I, I always, well, I don't always, but I often think of Viktor Frankl in his, you know, seminal book, man's search for meaning where he said, you know, you have to be worthy of the suffering. Like if you're going to be suffering, you have to learn from it. It just can't be, oh, this just happened to me and um, I'm going to be bitter. Like you have to understand 
um, that there's a sense of you outside of the pain that you've been through. And we have to find that core sense of you that could stand up. And if someone really, really was awful to you, eventually you'll face, you know, you'll have to face Vader. I've had people that have been molested and I, you know, I've had, they've eventually went and found the person who did it. If that person was married, they'd call their spouse and say, this is what this person did. Keep them away from your family. And they really get empowered that way by, by facing Vader and not living, but also expression. It's really important to express. Well, I have, I had a patient come in and said she was, uh, she was molested when she was by her father. And I said to her, well, who else have you told? And she said, nobody. And I said, well, do you have a best, this is our first session too. So it was a really ambitious of me. And I said, uh, do you have a best friend, a best girlfriend? She goes, yes. I go, well, on your way home, um, I want you to think about calling her and telling her what happened to you. And um, she did. And her friend had her own story because, you know, if, if something bad happened to you 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, if you keep, if you keep that within you, it's still alive. If the, it, it's still living, like you haven't put it down yet because you're like, you're full of the shame and your embarrassment and you feel like there's something wrong with you. God forbid if you, if the molestation felt good, you know, oh geez, oh boy, you know, and there's all this recrimination. So it's good to express instead of depress, but it does lead to depression. Depression is like a verb, like you're depressing all these awful things instead of mm -hmm. expression. You know, the thing about therapy is you want to be expansive. I want my patients to be expansive. I don't want to them to be constrictive. You know, I don't want them to hold it in. I want them to be expansive. So when you use a word like I'm going, you know, I see a psychologist mm -hmm. versus I see a clinical psychologist. What's no, I'm the, the difference? I'm the same. No, I'm the same. I'm, I'm a, I mean, you could be a research psychologist, but I'm a clinical psychologist. Yeah, yeah, clinical means you see patients. Yeah, yeah. Like we're clinicians, we see patients. Yeah, yeah. This is a great interview. I love this. I thought this, <laughs> this is really fun. <laughs> well, I mean, for example, so I know you talked about self-love, and I have a question, and I don't know if you do this at all, and I know we have a list of questions that we still we need to get through and all that. Mm -hmm. McKinsey drives out, but I have one question. So, and I don't think you do this, or maybe it's not what you want to do. I have a lot of patients that will come in, and I have been, every patient gets a physical exam, history and physical from their own personal doctor. Mm -hmm. But what I do is if I feel that there may be a little bit of a personality a disorder um, or a depression, um, basically a body dysmorphic disorder, anything like that. I have them get a psychologist versus or psychologist or psychiatrist workup to get them yep. approved for surgery. Sure. Oh, right. Now, you don't do that, correct? Or you no. only deal with the, again the self love? Yeah, I I I, I don't do that. No, uh, if if someone has a personality disorder, I usually don't work with them. That's th that's that's a very a tough hill to climb. Um, maybe I will. Maybe if someone's you know the thing about personality disorders is it's egocentric. Like they don't feel like they have a problem, right? Like if I'm, if I have paranoid personality disorder, it's an axis two, which means it's egocentric. Like, I don't think I have a problem. I think you have a problem for not being as careful as I am. You know, if access one is I don't want to be depressed. I don't want to be anxious. So I'm anxious to work on myself. But um, personality disorders can be really tough. I can understand why you, why you uh, look out for that. That makes sense. Do you see people though that that um, I mean maybe they do have body dysphoric disorder um, and helping people through that, where maybe they end up in Doctor Nassif's office thinking that they're 
completely ugly and he's probably looking at them going what are you talking about i mean have you seen that in your office i i, I do i you know i'm i'm very like um if if people um want to work on themselves as far as um uh, start working on their bodies and we you know do having some surgery I, I i think that usually that unless it's something like dr nassif what you're saying like you have to be very careful when you're going to put the knife I think that's very like, okay, you know, let's, you know, let's talk about it a little bit, but I don't think it's like, okay, we got to roll up our sleeves and see what's wrong with you. Correct. Like, <laughs> you should just be really happy with the way you are. It's like, no, I mean, I go out and yeah. spend a lot of money on a jacket or something and I'm going, I feel better about myself. Like, is that as, is that as vacuous as saying, you know, I don't like my neck? Um, no, <laughs> I don't know. It's like almost. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, it's like it's not, you know, on the on the on the Mount Everest of, um, of you know, spiritual awakening. But, you know, we 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 I we have to start from where we are, not at, not from where we want to be. And if it's a low impact thing and I want to get this done or someone wants to get this done, you know, when I when I when I was in my 20s or early th my 30s and I started to lose my hair. I didn't even know it, but the world told me, oh, Gary, oh, your, 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 your wow. forehead's a little higher. Oh, gee, thank you. Oh, oh, Gary, you know, all of a sudden, the world told me. It wasn't that I was like, you know, pacing back and forth, like, let me find out what's wrong with me. Like, I knew, I knew, or like, you know, I don't have great skin. So I was always like a little older, guessed a little older. And it's like, oh, Jesus, okay. so. It wasn't that I thought that until the world told me that. So then you then you get it. And then is, is it reasonable to say, can I go to Dr. Nassif, get this taken care of and move on with my life? Sh sure. Now, with that, on that same note of dealing with Dr. Nassif and the psycho psychological standpoint, mm -hmm. you know, being that you are considered the leading expert in relationships and couples and in therapy, have you um, had patients where one gets plastic surgery or anything uh, physically changed about them and it's had a negative impact on the relationship? Sure. I mean, you, you could imagine, right? You, you, because look, people, you can do what you can do, but people, will, who they are in their core will get revealed. You know, as much as, you know, you could put as, right. you know, it just will get, if, if I feel ugly on the inside, um, you know, it's like, it's really, really tough, but it, it depends if, if the relationship is strong, like so, someone, someone's not trying to prove something. Someone not, someone's not that trying to prove like, I want other women, for example, to think that I'm like handsome and desirable. Like if, if that's, in my unconscious or if that's part of the equation or my wife thinks, you know, I want, you know, I want other men to desire me or something. Um, that's lighting a fuse. Like you may say it's harmless, so I'm not going to act out, right. but it's the law of unintended consequences that you just have to be kind of, hmm. you got to have to be kind of careful of. So then we can see that actually, I mean, this yeah, is that's very part deep. of my story. I mean, this is all very Yeah, it deep. is. And it's getting me a little emotional. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I, I got to tell you, I truly <laughs> noticed that. Trying hard not to cry. Did you? Okay, yeah, yeah I'm trying hard not yeah, to cry. Yeah, I kind of noticed that. I mean, you know, listen. Uh, could you tell me why that hit you the way it did? I mean, it first started with uh, talking about my father. And as you could tell from the interview, I love my parents so much. And they're getting older. I've moved and I'm, I'm thrilled that I get to drive back tomorrow. I mean, my son's having surgery, but I'm thrilled I get to drive back and see them. But it's it's gotten more difficult now that I've moved away. So that it started with that. And then when you started to talk about some of the other things, that just like ticked another box. And then now to talk about something that, that has been in the press and, and has been out there, um, you know, the fact that, that my husband was honest with me, that as I was going down this road of, of fillers and trying to fix myself, because like you said, I was told I looked bad. I was told by the public, by my, my, um, bosses that I did not look okay. 
and to go through years and years of that trying to fix that problem only to find out that my husband was losing attraction that was that was painful that was extremely painful and and Dr. Nassif knows you know obviously we know the whole story um but that that's why this is it's it's interesting cuz Dr. Nassif you and I have been through so many podcasts now together and this is the first time where it's 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 this one's getting me mm. Well, that's where that whole self-love comes back in. Mm. Especially yeah. you went through a lot of those problems, issues, and um, especially now you're away from your parents. Listen, I get it. I mean, I'm 61. Yeah. I don't have any more parents. It's hard thinking about this because I start thinking about some of these things just like you do. So now, yeah. this is a very general question, mm-hmm. Dr. Penn, and I don't really know if you can give us um, like some of me ask me, what are the best tips for skincare? Yeah, I can give that. <laughs> but what are the best <laughs> tips? And especially a lot of the kids are dealing with this, you know, now, post COVID and stuff, full anxiety. But mm-hmm. when you have anxiety or dysfunctional or intrusive thoughts, mm-hmm. um, a lot of people I go, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And depression, I mean, is it or depression? I mean, you can have a bunch of those. You can have them combined, obviously. But is there anything generally that you can tell these folks that have some of these issues, best practices of what to do, what advice, hmm. what tips? Good one. What What comes to my mind, it's a great question, but what, what comes to my mind is when I'll ask someone, so tell me, you know, what, what you're feeling. Like, so doc, tell me what you're feeling. And you go, oh, I, I don't know. And I'll say, well, take a minute. And whenever I say take a minute, there's always an answer behind that. Mm. So, so often we just, we have these feelings and we we're very like precious with them and we keep them within our own psychology. We, I, I have a saying that uh, I think it's one of the, one of the things that have helped the most, the, the people the most throughout my career. Um, is that one of the one of the hallmarks one of the one of the hallmarks of psychological health is the ability to hate your parent well? Because huh. so many people feel really really bad about having negative feelings towards their parents. Now, sometimes I know I use the word hate on purpose because it's provocative, right? It's a provocative word. Sometimes it's a capital H hate, right? Your parents molested. Me and my parents, you know, abandoned me. My, my, my father beat the crap out of me, like, or whatever it is. There's, you know, there's a capital H hate. But a lot of times it's just a small H hate. My father was always working. He was never around. My mom was a little depressed. The point is, if you could, if you could be okay with that and, and you could hate them in a healthy way, you also get to be able to love them because you're not loving them because you feel guilty for being angry with them. Wow. So if you could just like if you can if you can love them, um, even though you're like you know you know dad you moved away from me when I was a kid and I I hate you for that, and you know and then you maybe could work it through if if the parents are still alive and something. So if we can be if we can be as open with our emotions because if we're all like if we're all like this and we're all you know clenched and and this, and it's like, like, we're so precious. Like we don't want, I'm not a victim. I don't want, you know what? Sometimes someone will say to me, Gary, uh, um, how, how are you doing? I go, I'm insecure. And they go, well, how come? I go, just bad parents. <laughs> it always gets a laugh. I think it's, think it's funny. So it's just like a get out of jail funny. free card. You know, bad just parents. Bad. <laughs> so it's like if you could be conversational about it and you don't think people get really miserable because they think of the bad things that happened to them mm-hmm. it had something to do if uh, for, with of uh, with them now m- maybe but a lot of times it had nothing to do with you well you know uh, i've worked with people who were um adopted and from the vjj to the new parent they were just right there, right? From the very beginning, they're taking, mm-hmm. here's, here's your child, right? So all the imprinting is with the new parents. To, to the 
40 years later, 50 years later, they will be thinking, why wasn't I good? At, why wasn't I good enough to be kept? Wow. It will be a core feeling of theirs. What was wrong with me that I was given away? And it's, yeah. just, it's heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking. It's just like, oh, like such, it's such a shame. Just, it's just, it just breaks my heart when they say, you know, it's like, okay. So they obviously are told to meet or when they feel it's appropriate age, yeah, they were orphaned yeah. that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me ask you another question. You keep talking about the parents. Sure, it could be it could be neighbors. It could be it could be growing okay. up in a, in a right, war. But, but but let's say parents. The question is, I mean, listen, I didn't have the best upbringing with my parents. They loved me, but it wasn't great. Very dysfunctional mm -hmm. family. And yeah, you know, it's caused some problems with my God rest his soul, my brother, and then my mm -hmm. sister, mm -hmm. and uh, probably me less. But when can you actually? Put on your big boy pants, big girl pants, or big non-binary pants, and deal with some of that yourself, and say, okay, you know, how much of this really is me? Yes, oh, I, they yes. screwed me up, but hey, I got to take some responsibility. Right. Well, you're you're absolutely right, but this, you know, doing what I'm suggesting is actually taking responsibility because it's not easy to be angry or to hate your parents, and it doesn't. It could be, it doesn't have to be parents per se, but it's like, what I'm saying is that's part of the process. And it's not like just because I had bad parents that I get, uh, I get a free pass. You have to go into therapy. You have to work it through it. You have to understand your own situations, like what you were taught. Like if I, if I grew, grew up in a home, like in the deep South and I was a racist, there's a world that exists where I'm like, you know, 30 years old and say, you know what? I'm not going to be a racist anymore. I think that's silly. I'm not going to do that. Like we have that opportunity to become a free thinker. The, one of the, one of the, one of the North stars of my work is I want you to be a free thinker. I want you to think about all the, all the things that you take for granted, like all the things you take for granted, like, you know, in the, is, just 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 become conscious try to become conscious and a free thinker but you're absolutely right doctor that at the end of the day we have to wake up and we have to be yes. our be our best selves and to and to lean on well this and this and this and it's really perceptive of you because i'm thinking i'm glad you actually said it because it's very informative but when when we deal with it then it doesn't, it's, it, it dissipates. It's not, it's not like there all the time. It's like, like it dissipates because we, we've dealt with it and it's settled business. It, it's part of my, it's part of our history, but it's not activated. When we don't deal with it, it tends to activate itself. So that leads to part two for myself. And listen, you know, we have a list of questions, but quite honestly, I mean, we're kind of going down this, Wonderful rabbit hole. <laughs> so you have someone who is a self loather. Sure. How do you get them to like yourself, like themselves? Is it years of therapy, exercises, hypnotherapy? Oh. I mean, what the heck? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, well, look, not not liking yourself, and it depends to the degree. Some people, it's hard to help them. But it, it is, it's tough. But if someone's not liking themselves, again, it's, it's because somehow the world has told them that. Sometimes the world has told them that. Now, it also could be when I was, you know, when I was young, when I was like um, in my like teens or something, I, I was just a bad kid. I, I, I just was so insecure that the only way I felt good is to put other people down. It was just really bad. So there, there are things that we can do to, you know, how to win friends and influence people, how to learn, uh, how to, how to like fake it till you make it. I've had people that are were so unable just to be fluid with their thinking, or, or or with their conversing with people. I would have them join Second City. I would have them join um, uh, improv groups, and to go take classes. 
and to learn how just to say, you know, just to go with the supposition and shamelessly. Just, I, I was talking to a new patient the other day and I, I, I recommended that she goes to improv and it was terrifying to her. This is a really smart, educated woman. And the idea of going and saying, you know, a hippopotamus knocked on my front door, your line, and she would like, oh, is there a right? Like she couldn't say the line that's supposed, whatever line, you know, whatever line you were supposed to say. So it's, it's, it's about loosening up. And part of it, you know, is what, what's such a joy for me is to love my patients in all of their shame and to have compassion for them and to care for them and, and to, and to see them in their darkness and to say, let it out. It's okay. And when you get to be a doctor, you get to be someone who's well known uh, and you're able to say that it, it, it's healing sometimes. Like it's healing uh, to say you're, you're, whatever you're feeling, of course you feel bad about yourself. Of course you have self-loathing. How else were you? And then they start to think about it. You mean it's not because I am objectively horrible? No. It's possible that the world told you something different. And, or if, they're, if they are really bad, then I'd say you have to learn how to be graceful. You have to learn how to be you know, kind to people. And that, that would be something like you can't sit there and say, hey, fatso, how you doing? And then the person punches you in the nose. It's like, why did he do that? Or why did she do that? Like, no, you have to, you have to learn how to be kind. Uh, and it's, you know, it's something that I've learned. I've been very, I've been, you know, it's one of the gifts of, of being married to a wonderful woman. It's like I, I, my, my kindness factor has just gone up exponentially. It's just like, oh, mm. oh, look what I was missing all these years. This, this I got to tell you, I don't know, you know, we didn't even got this into it. amazing. Can we we have to set part two of this. If you have time, yeah. Dr. Pim. I'll tell you this. We never, we never even got to our questions. I got it. You, yeah. you actually read my mind because this, this is like, this is like, you know, having like, you know, so much fun for an hour. Like, you know, when you have, you meet someone and it's just the hour goes by. I was thinking, I don't want this to end. So absolutely. So, um, thank you, Dr. Penn. It's been, it's been a pleasure. So I'll, I'll just wait to hear from you. All right. We're going to definitely do part two. And I know everybody's on a time crunch, but I want to make sure that everybody knows how to reach you. I want everybody to know about your amazing book because I've read it several times over. Uh, my, <laughs> so well, please. I'm actually writing my second book right now, but, but yes. My, but my uh, my first book is I can't believe my life has come to this. Amazing book, <laughs> Doctor Nassim. That sounds like a movie. Amazing. <laughs> I can't believe my life has come it's to this. So good, it's so. You know, good. I, I figured I figured back in the day when they had bookstores, if I was looking at the self help book, that title would speak to me. Um, oh yeah. And my and, <laughs> and my website is drgarypen.com. And how do you get that awesome. book? Is it? Amazon or where do you get Amazon the book? Get it to, yeah, it's a fun book. It's it's really Dr. Nassif. I can't say enough amazing things about it. It's so good. It stays in my handbag, actually. <laughs> well, wow. listen, it's a pleasure meeting you. We look forward to part two. Very good. And um, thank you, Dr. Penn. And you listen. You take care of yourself. And um, uh, you know, our closing statements always are, uh, Mackenzie. How do people find you? Pretty much all handles of social media at M Westmore, Dr. Nassif. Dr. Paul Nassif, Dr. Paul Nassif. Look at that. That's way. And as always, everybody, please send your questions in. We love those questions. If you have questions for um, Dr. Penn, Dr. Nassif, myself, please send them in. Um, hit us up on uh, Demystify Beauty on Instagram or on YouTube. And until next time, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Demystify Beauty, produced by Gotham Production Studios. If you have any questions for future episodes, please don't hesitate to reach out to us on Instagram at Demystify Beauty or email us at demystifybeauty at gmail.com. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show. See you next time. <laughs>